What was quite novel, was quite revolutionary, was the concept of connecting physical businesses, physical assets, in real time to a digital platform. Few companies did this at the time. Welcome to the latest installment of The Positive Disruptor, where I speak to founders and business leaders who are transforming their sector for the better. Today, I am joined by Jose Neves, the founder of Farfetch, the platform that connects customers with brands all over the world and is one of the fastest growing e-commerce platforms globally. Jose is also at the forefront of reimagining the future of retail, blending the digital and physical shopping experience, but more to come on that later. Well, thank you so much for joining me today, Jose. I'm so delighted to be chatting with you. When we were doing um, our research, it was quite obvious you found the love of technology very early on at the age of eight. Uh, you were programming computers. I'd love to hear a bit more about that passion for technology, but equally, where did your love of fashion start to come from? I was absolutely um, in awe of, of uh, the whole world of technology since a uh, very young age. I, started coding when I was eight uh, by accident. Um, and my parents gave me a, you know, a, a computer for Christmas with no video games. There was no internet, <laughs> of course, at the time. Um, and, and the only thing you could do was coding. So that's, that's how I, I really started um, you know, to get, get an interest in computer science. And that was all my teenage years and all the way up um, to uh, to the age of 19 when I started my first business, which was actually a software development business um, with the current CTO of Farfetch, Cipriano. So we've been stretching back 27 years now. Um, and at, at, that, at that point, um, I really didn't uh, understand fashion. And I actually, as any you know, uh, good old geek, I, I kind of dismissed it. Um, and um, you know, I, I couldn't see what I see today very clearly, that fashion is part of culture, part of culture as much as music, as much as literature, as much as um, art. Uh, but that, that wasn't something that was clear to me um, until we started developing software for the fashion industry, being from the north of Portugal. Uh, most people are involved directly, indirectly, or have relatives in the family that are in the fashion industry. And so that ended up being the, the companies that we were developing software for. And, and, you know, so I got to know fashion from the inside out, actually. So it was going to the factory floors and understanding how products were being made and collections were being designed and then going to trade shows and seeing how designers were presenting the collections and fashion weeks and all of that. That's when I fell in love with fashion. And, and obviously that then as a consumer, that's when I, the, the love of fashion came as well, but it came from inside out. It's uh, a funny story, I think. Great story. And I love the fact you've been working with your CTO for 27 years. That's amazing. A lot of people won't be aware. Um, I think we often, when we see such successful founders like yourself, we think of kind of the latest thing, that, which is Farfetch, but you, you really are a serial entrepreneur. You touched on doing software, um, but also you uh, built a business called Swear. I think it's fair to say it was a unique brand of shoes. Then you went on uh, to set up B Store in London, Savile Row in 2001. So it's quite clear that you've definitely always had the appetite for being an entrepreneur. So it'd be good to sort of hear, you know, how do you go from that and then eventually take the journey where it really it took you, the path took you to Farfetch. What was that journey for you? Well, I think it, it was a, a long journey. And, and when people uh, say, wow, you built Farfetch in 12 years and, and, you know, it's a global company, a listed company, etc. That, that was so fast. Uh, to me, it, it took 27 years and my entire adult life, right? Because I don't, you know, in my, in my mind, it's all part of a continuum. If I didn't start with Cipriano when I was 19, I wouldn't have fallen in love with fashion. If I hadn't started Swear, moved to London and, and got to know the community, the, the creative community, the boutiques, etc., probably the idea of Firefetch wouldn't have come about. Uh, and so on and so on. So to me, it's, it was a journey with ups and downs, more downs than ups, as, 
as uh, you know, as businesses, uh, as the case often with businesses and, and startups, and um, yeah, and, and uh, many cost corrections, lots of mistakes, lots of pitfalls. Um, uh, some avoided, some not, and um, yes, yeah, so it, it sounds like uh, to me it feels like a, a long journey, but at the same time, like a journey that. It's still in the in the very very early innings of it, and and there's so much to do in this industry. And and uh, on the other hand, um, you know, it, it just feels like they won every day. So it's um, and I guess you know many entrepreneurs have that that feeling as well in their businesses. It's something difficult to explain. One thing I've observed: you've always been a really huge champion of like emerging designers and boutiques and independent boutiques which i think has always set you apart and obviously other other ways that farfetch is very different so maybe for people for the few people that that aren't customers if you could describe a little bit about you know what you set out to do with farfetch you know why is it unique and different to maybe other platforms they may use sure i think you know farfetch um is in in our space is a very unique company because the high-end designer fashion industry um, uh, doesn't have multiple platforms. That's reality. We, we are the only global platform for an entire industry in the sense that everyone else that you usually shop from will be a retailer, either an online retailer or a department store or a brand. You go to brand.com and shop from there. So when you go on Farfetch, you are shopping from a community and the community is made of small local businesses. So that's the boutique network that we have on Firefetch. So we have 50 countries, uh, 750 uh, companies with multiple, uh, obviously then multiple locations. Uh, most of them, they're family owned businesses, sometimes generational. We have boutiques that are over 100 years old, very traditional. We have boutiques that are just five years old. So you have the new kids on the block. Um, so, so that's where you're getting your products from. Um, but also, of course, we have the brands participating directly on the platform. Um, we have 550 designers selling directly on the, on the platform. And that is, um, I think, quite unique. So you have the curation of the multi-brand boutique small business angle. And you have the access of the, of the super brand. Um, and that's, that's where we're different. So if you're shopping from Farfetch, um, you, you will be shopping from a community, from a, create, a global creative community and not from a single company. And when, when you were launching um, the business, I, mean, I think it's fair to say it was a time where the likes of Netta Porter was very much at the forefront. And so I suppose, what made you believe this approach would work, I suppose, you know, it must have been quite tough to explain those differences and then, and then therefore what the benefit was to investors at the time. Well, actually, I think the the success of Net uh, which was a visionary company and brand uh, that Natalie uh, started in, in 2000, I think, so uh, much earlier than us, um, actually was fantastic because it, it really paved the way for uh, people to recognize that luxury, this category, is is a highly attractive category online, and it's it's uh, something people shop online. Some people want to enter, uh, you know, uh, discover and be uh, inspired by online, and and that that was actually uh, great. And um, so we started with the benefit of that 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 it was a category that uh, went from non-believers uh, in, in year 2000, people thought they were never going to sell online if you were a brand or if you were a consumer, probably never shop online, uh, to a category that by 2008 was kind of accepted that this was going to be big. Um, and I think it, it, was, it was not hard to, uh, to speak to investors about marketplaces and, and platforms because they saw by 2008, they had seen Amazon, they had seen eBay. Um, what was quite novel, was quite revolutionary, was the concept of connecting physical businesses, physical assets, in real time to a digital platform. And a uh, few companies did this at the time. 
I think Uber didn't exist at the time, Airbnb didn't exist at the time. So the concept of having something physical, in our case was a boutique, a shop, and, and, and beautiful products in it, that without creating a new product, a single new product, or a single new business, we would connect in real time, have visibility into that inventory, and have it delivered as quickly as possible. In many cities, 20 cities, we have same day delivery. In 10, we have 90 minutes. Um, that at the time was completely revolutionary, even for investors. But I think the, the difficult part was really to convince the, the industry, because the industry is a very uh, offline industry, it's a very traditional industry. I think that that was the, the trickiest part. If I kind of now go to present day, it's, it's fair to say 2020 was an extraordinary year for the business. Uh, you turned a profit. You obviously had a landmark a billion dollar investment by Alibaba and then obviously an investment by luxury um, company, Richemont. So it'd be good to hear how is that going to sort of change the business? How does that help you um, scale faster? No doubt that's what I'd imagine the big part of the investment's about. Yeah, I think, I think recapping on 2020, I think it was a very challenging year for every human being on the planet at all levels, and uh, we're not any different. And, and when the pandemic started, for us it started in January, because we have teams in China, we have 500 people in China, we have a team in Tokyo, in Japan, they went through lockdown um, in, in January, February, uh, so dealing with, with, with that was our, you know, uh, beginning of, of 2020. And then obviously when the pandemic hit worldwide in, in March, um, no one knew um, how, how this was going to pan out in terms of demand and in terms of even operations. Where were we going to be able to continue to, uh, you know, pick up in 50 different locations and deliver in 190? And how does that, was that going to work? So it was quite challenging. You know, our team was extremely galvanized. They, they were galvanized by the fact, okay, you know what? What can we do as a platform for the global industry in, in this pandemic? And we cannot save lives, but we can save businesses. And, and that's what we did. So we started a campaign called Hashtag Support Boutiques in April. Um, and we, we, we favored all the small guys, so all the boutiques um, and small designers that those boutiques represent primarily. Um, and we, re we surface them all the way up in our algorithms and we push them on emails and on push messages and on beautiful editorial on the homepage, uh, which is ongoing. And, um, and then we help them with logistics. We help them even with sourcing masks so that they could operate safely. There was a mask shortage uh, at the point in Italy and we were importing them from, from Japan. So I think this is, this is uh, an example where a company that is, you know, laser focused on its mission and values doesn't lose, lose sight of them and the benefits that, that can come out of it. I think, you know, the, the other part of your question around the uh, Alibaba and Hishmo and, and Artemis uh, deal um, is really about the, the future of this industry. And we call it luxury new retail. It's this vision and it will, uh, it, it is not a coincidence that uh, Jack Ma's uh, vision is called new retail in China. Um, our vision for luxury retail was called augmented retail. So we brought these two together. We call it luxury new retail. Uh, and that's the key here. Many people think, oh, this is about Farfetch opening a store on Timo. That's a tiny part of the, of the deal, right? So, so the, this is the coming together of, um, of two visions uh, for an industry uh, that has not had a global platform to, to bring this digitization of retail, be it online retail or offline retail, to, uh, to reality. And Alibaba has done it in China with supermarkets, with the Hana chain, uh, with convenience stores, tens of thousands of uh, you know, independently run convenience stores connected in real time to the Alibaba platform with mutual, with, in a win-win uh, partnership. That has not happened in luxury. We're at the forefront of that. As you know, we started with Chanel digitizing their physical experience, and that is going incredibly well. We're accelerating it and rolling it out to more Chanel boutiques. Uh, and now we're about to, uh, to launch uh, Star of the Future version 2.0 uh, in Browns Brook Street. Uh, and that's going to be uh, our opportunity to showcase this big vision of luxury new retail uh, to the entire industry. 
and that's online, that's offline, that's mono brand, that's multi brand, that's the whole spectrum in the single view of the journey, single view of the customer, single view of the, pr the product as well. We know we touched on Netta Porter, and I know recently. Um, well, a couple of years ago, Natalie joined uh, your board as a non-exec. So was that interesting having, I suppose, a positive disruptor herself come and join you and, and help partner and be on your journey that clearly uh, in a space that you're positively disrupting as well? Yes, I, I think I've always admired uh, Natalie. Um, she was always a huge source of inspiration to me. As I said, I think she paved the way for the rest of us. Um, you know, very early on, very bravely so in 2020. And let's not forget, this was just the post-bubble uh, burst, like the dot-com burst uh, of 99, 2000. Uh, very bravely, she entered e-commerce, which was not, you know, uh, fashionable, let's, let's say, and, and in fashion. <laughs> so, so it was um, uh, quite inspirational. I think she's an incredible female entrepreneur, and, and uh, uh, incredible, you know, source of inspiration for for uh, so many of us. Uh, so it was, uh, you know, I'm very grateful that she uh, agreed to, to to join us at the stage of our journey, and and you know, to to great uh, mutual benefit. And and uh, yes, it was all the conversations I had with her, and all the ideas, and all the vision, you know, and future gazing. Uh, was uh, um, uh, forgettable. That was really, really great. I'd just like to ask a few questions. Um, I suppose you, as you, as a, as a leader, because I think the more I interview uh, extraordinary founders like you, you know, it always sounds not that it sounds easy. You talked early on about having the downs, not just the ups, but it's always you know you're clearly very in control of, of what you're doing. But there must be days, particularly as your business is scaled that must be tough, must have a lot of mental kind of strain on you. Like, how do you cope? So of course, I know there's a lot of great stuff, but how do you cope on those days where things just become very, very pressurized and it's all on you? Well, I, th I think it's, um, you touch on, on something very important, which is mental resilience and mental uh, well-being in general. And, and we, we're very focused uh, right now at Farfetch. Uh, we're, we're kicking off a big, big program in, term, in terms of well-being and, and mental health. Personally, and this is a personal view, I think we are going to have a second pandemic after this one, unfortunately, and that will be uh, the prevalence of mental health uh, issues, be it anxiety, be it insomnia, be it depression. Uh, we saw that absolutely skyrocketing uh, through the pandemic. Unfortunately, as human beings, we don't reset. Uh, by ourselves, you know, it, it takes some tools, it takes some resources, and normally it takes external help for us to be able to uh, to reset and overcome traumatic experiences. It has been a traumatic year, um, so we're very focused on on that. Um, I think, you know, personally, um, on one hand, I've been 27 years uh, uh, as an entrepreneur, so uh, there is an element of natural resilience that, that you battle scarred, uh, your battle scarred, so to say. So you, you kind of build it. But, you know, I, you know, to me, it helps me a lot that, that um, um, you know, I, I tend to embrace um, uh, whatever comes as, as a lesson, as something uh, that is here to show us something, um, you know, and, and, uh, and there's always, um, and, and you know, I know this, this sounds like a cliche, but you can actually... <laughs> You can actually live this and you can actually um, take the adversities and take what seems to be, you know, uh, 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 blocks or roadblocks in your journey as um, signposts for change that you need to do internally first. And, and then when you do that change internally, you almost miraculously find out that red, that roadblock was not only overcome, but it actually now looks like the best thing that has happened to you. It's a very, I mean, we, we you have experienced it as well. We all experience it in life, don't we? Um, but uh, the most systematic approach to, you know, every single day, every single uh, event that happens, to embrace it openly and uh, and to try to understand what does that mean to you and how do you need to 
manage yourself in that situation actually normally uh, leads to a, to a solution very quickly and um, or not and if not leads to a change and uh, and that change normally is, is what you needed to do in, in the first place anyway. All that's left for me to say is a huge thank you uh, to Jose. It has been fascinating. I feel like I've learned an awful lot. I think it's fair to say as a business you are constantly innovating and thinking about all the ways that you can constantly add value to your community and to the overall ecosystem, which is really apparent. And, and that values, you know, in your belief system is, is really very obvious. So um, I'm so happy to see the success you're having and wish you uh, continued success uh, and reshaping or reimagining that retail experience we're all going to be living with. So thank you. Likewise, and congratulations with everything you're doing at Snap. It's very inspirational. Uh, to see you know how creativity and and love for what you do pays off um, and uh, very excited to continue to collaborate with uh, with snap uh, on on all things including this uh, this initiative which I think is great so thank you thanks a lot